It is now 5 p.m. on the West Coast, so uh, I am going to kick this off and get this started. So uh, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm just going to dive in here and uh, just mute all the microphones so we can uh, focus on uh, on what's actually happening in the meetup here. But uh, welcome to the Vancouver Power BI and Modern Excel user group meetup for Tuesday, March 7th. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about monkey tools today. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to go through and, uh, and sort of talk about um, what's coming up. Thank the sponsors and all that good stuff. So... Um, Skillwave is the title sponsor of the uh, of the um, meetup that we have here. Uh, this is the training platform that I run with Matt Ellington. Um, and if you are looking for fantastic training in Power Query, Power BI, Power Pivot, uh, all those wonderful technologies, as well as just general Excel stuff, um, you should check out skillwave.training. We run some really good stuff over there. Excel Guru is the parent company of Skillwave and also the distributor of Monkey Tools, uh, which we'll be talking about a little bit later on. Um, the next meetups that we have coming up in two weeks, Weeks. Uh, actually, let's go for a month. We've got our stuff flipped here. In about a month, our next Excel track, we've got uh, my friend Chris Newman is going to be joining us to talk about uh, add-ins in Excel. So that should be uh, should be good. It's the first time that we'll have Chris on the program. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, another first timer for our program is uh, Tim Weinzeffel, who is going to be joining us for integrating Power BI with Power Apps and Power Automate. That is our next meetup that's coming up in a couple of weeks on March 21st. Uh, Chris's will be on April 4th. Uh, both of those will be starting at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So uh, the RSVPs are open, so you can sign up for those to get notified and reminded of those sessions. Um, just a quick note here that the uh, my self-service business, uh, business intelligence academy is always open for registration. Our next kickoff date is actually tomorrow. Um, if you are looking for how to master or take your skills to the next level uh, in Power Query, Power Pivot, um, DAX Dimensional Modeling, uh, Power BI, this is the program that really goes end to end with this. Uh, you want to have some pivot table experience before you dive into this, uh, but we've got over 40 hours of training and coaching. There's uh, Ask Ken sessions that are held twice a month. Uh, you get access to my Monkey Tools software, my books, uh, recipe cards, all kinds of stuff. This is my premier training program. And um, if you're uh, if you're interested in really, as I say, uh, upskilling, this is a great place to go with both Excel and Power BI, so you can learn to use the right tool for the right job. And uh, yeah, hopefully uh, we'll see some of you there. Um, we also have an Excel Fundamentals Bootcamp that I run at Skillwave. Uh, again, the next kickoff date for this is tomorrow, but we'll have another one in a month or so. Um, this is where we teach core skills for Excel analysts, talking about formulas, pivot tables, data visualization, things like that. It's about 30 hours of training coach and also has access to the Ask Ken sessions. Uh, all of those are recorded, of course, as well. Um, so if you've got people on your team that you'd like to upskill, this is a great program uh, for them. Or if you feel that you want to upskill on your basic level and fill a knowledge gap for yourself as well. This meetup, along with every meetup, is recorded, will be hosted on the Skillwave YouTube channel. I will post, uh, I'm actually going to have this one produced tomorrow, um, so you will get a notification through meetup when it's ready, uh, so watch for that. Um, I also want to just call out really quickly here some of the monkey shorts videos that we have. Uh, this is three minutes or less of technical content from end to end. So we've got a couple of uh, different episodes that we're sharing here, showing missing dates in a pivot table, creating late fact tables, one of those key techniques that I actually teach in my self-service BI boot camps. Uh, if you're interested in those, you can check out the entire playlist at Skillwave. The last thing that I'm going to mention before I cut over and start talking about the actual content that we have for today is that if you would like to come and speak at Vanpug, we would love to have you just fill out this little form here. Um, the link for this has already been uploaded. The slide deck's already been uploaded to the meetup group, so you can always grab those links there. Um, and we always love having new speakers come and share what they're doing, cool things with Excel or Power BI or anything that's tied in in between. All right. So. That's the welcome slides and uh, and the sponsor stuff. Let me just kill that deck off here. And what I'm going to do is I'm now going to go and share the topic for today. So uh, from the beginning, um, welcome to Monkey Tools. So um, I woke up this morning. Actually, it was a pretty cool day because I didn't know that one of my friends was going to post about how awesome Monkey Tools was on LinkedIn. And it got a lot, a lot of traffic on LinkedIn about, hey, wow, you know, this is a great tool. Some people don't know what it is. Some people do know what it is and love it. And, you know, then there's other things trying to convince people that they should try it out and love it. So um, I thought that I would sort of take this uh, this presentation here to go through and talk about 
some of the what's new, but also just give some demos as to some of the stuff that actually happens here. Um, for those of you who are new to my meetup groups, I have a Teams window sitting open here with a chat feature in it. Uh, so if there's any questions that come up as you go along, please just dump them into the chat. I'm constantly watching that as we go, and I would love to have any questions at all about this tool that, uh, that you're seeing here. So, um, if you don't know me, uh, just really quickly here, my name is Ken. Um, I am an accountant, and that's not just an OnlyFans thing. Um, I'm not on OnlyFans at all, but uh, I really am a fully qualified accountant, an FCPA, FCMA based in Canada. I run a little website called xlguru.ca where we have a blog, a bunch of help articles, and a free uh, help form as well. And I'm a founding partner of Training, which is where we actually go and teach people how to use Power Query, Power Pivots, and uh, Power BI, and all kinds of wonderful things. I am a Microsoft MVP have been since 2006. I'm actually really excited that uh, on Saturday, I'm making my journey down to Redmond where I'm going to be hanging out with the Excel team for a week uh, to talk about Excel, the things that need to be fixed, the things that they're building and stuff like that. Um, it's a super exciting time of year for me. Uh, so yeah, that's one of the cool things that I get to do. It doesn't mean I know everything about Excel, far from it, but it does mean that I get to talk to the engineers and give them feedback and hopefully get them to change things for the better. I am a software developer and an author. I'm a software developer of Monkey Tools is one of the software products that I've built. Um, this is probably the biggest one that I've ever built and is one that we're going to talk about today. Uh, you may also know me from books like MS for Data Monkey or the newer version, Master Your Data. Um, I always love seeing feedback from people that uh, that have hit either one of these books. Um, Master Your Data is the newer version updated with a lot more content in it. So if you are considering buying a book on Power Query, uh, you definitely want the one in the bottom right. All right, so let's talk a little bit before we dive in here about the philosophy behind Monkey Tools and my philosophy towards developing software generally. So Monkey Tools itself, the target audience is pretty much Excel users. Um, it does work with Power BI in certain areas, but the main focus of who I am and who I build for is Excel people. I'm looking for people that want to save time building Excel solutions. And I mean, honestly, who doesn't, right? But this is also an and or thing. So maybe you don't care about saving time, but you work with Power Query and Power Pivot. There's a tools inside the software for you, or if you need to model or audit models that you receive from others. So these are sort of the three people that I generally am targeting with the software here. I used to say it was targeted to Power Query and Power Pivot users. The tool's grown. And that's one of the things that's really interesting now is that some of the stuff I'm going to show you, I'm going to focus on through the first parts of the meetup here, actually don't really have anything to do with Power Query or Power Pivot per se. They're just general Excel help things. So that's going to be kind of an interesting component, I think, for, for people to sort of see what's, uh, what's grown over the last year inside Monkey Tools. My guiding principles as far as uh, building software and whatnot, um, I am a firm believer in the do no harm philosophy. Uh, I don't do stuff inside your workbooks unless you ask me to do it. We're not just injecting things. There's no hidden properties or anything like that. Your workbook, once you've used monkey tools on it, will work in plain old vanilla Excel. That means that you can use this to build a solution for yourself or for others. You can ship it to them. And if they don't have monkey tools installed, it will still work. Okay, and that's a really, really important thing to cover here. Uh, I've got one installer. I have one version of software that I release. It installs without admin rights, which is always useful for people who are trying to install software. You don't have to call IT to get it installed. Um, I am a firm believer in delivering a bunch of free features. Uh, you can do more and do things easier with a pro license, um, but there's a lot of free stuff in there that should hopefully keep people on the software, even if they don't actually want to contribute uh, to the financial side of it. Uh, we also learn from user choices as we go. This is a big thing for me too. I can't stand having to reset defaults all the time. And this is something that I want to put into my software to try and help um, you be more efficient as well. Finally, something that's super important to me, again, uh, no license lock-in. Um, I have worked with software where when you actually um, you know, go and install something in the organization, you basically have to pay for it forever because you can't get rid of it. Once you've actually built something for in it, you need to keep it around. This is not the way that I work. You can opt in, you can opt out of my licensing model as much or as little as you want to. That's totally up to you. I don't really care. Um, but the main thing here is that, like I say, you, this is really a tool that is targeted for the person that is using it. Once the solution is built and sent to somebody else, it will just work. So, um, so Zach, you say, I don't see monkey tools as an add-in that can be added within Excel. Would that be possible to do in the future? Um, so, uh, 
it's not because it is released as a com add-in it must be installed it's not one of these things that you can just go into the developer tab and click add-ins add that's not the way this one works it works on a different framework and there's a lot of reasons why i chose on that one so no it does have to run through an actual um, dot application installer in order to install properly on your system so um, but thanks for asking uh, that's a great question all right Let's get the elephant out of the room on this one right now, Monkey Tools licensing. How does this work? Uh, we install on a named user basis. When you buy a pro, well, even if you, you just install a trial version, uh, we will allow you to install it on up to three different computers. Uh, so it is licensed to a specific person. The reason why three, because I believe most people probably have a work laptop, a home laptop, and maybe a work or home desktop. Um, so there you go, that's your three generally. Uh, if you're a consultant, you are allowed to install it on your client site. You just may wanna release it before you go to another client site because you're gonna wanna keep those licenses. Um, the pricing model for this, we actually have two price sets. One, we have a, what we call the forever free community version. Uh, this will always be free. Um, it, it's interesting because I post new updates. I actually posted two updates today to Monkey Tools. If you're on a free license, you'll get the updates. Now, it may not have features for you, but it will get the updates and any bug fixes that I put out are released across the board. I don't do a different code base for free users. We also have a trial pro license. It gives you two weeks to almost everything in the software, and then it automatically reverts to free license if you decide not to uh, enable it. Um, you don't have to actually subscribe to it with a credit card in order to try things out, okay? So that's kind of an important factor too. Uh, if you do decide that you like the pro features, you can always get a pro license subscription. You can opt in and out whenever you like. So if you wanna go monthly, you can do that. Opt in for a month and opt out for a month. Doesn't matter to me. You can get an annual license. That's the most affordable, um, but there you go. That's the way these things work. Full details on pricing and the availability of the add-ins can be picked up at monkeytools.ca. All right, so let's talk about features. Now, Monkey Tools, when you install it, gives you a new ribbon, okay? So it has a Monkey Tools tab that you can see that's showing up here. I had to split it into two components because, well, there's a lot of stuff on it. It is broken down into two categories. We have what I call convenience features. You can also paraphrase these as buttons that I stole from other ribbon tabs, okay? So these all exist somewhere else inside Excel. I brought them all on one tab so you don't have to flip tabs back and forth because extra clicks drive me nuts. So those are convenience, just repurposing Excel stuff. Everything else is what we call a monkey tools feature, okay? And these are tools that I have specifically created, designed and released, uh, tested, refined, done all kinds of work on in order to try and make your life easier. These tools are broken down into two categories, okay? So we have two different ones. We've got what we call monkeys and we have what we call sleuths. Now, I watch way too many law and order shows. So every time I hear this, I've got the dun-dun that goes in the background because I'm thinking about the sleuths who are the ones that investigate crime and the monkeys are the ones that go and prosecute the offenders, right? They're the ones that actually go and take action and do different things. So basically what you look at here is sleuths is about understanding what's going on monkeys are about doing things okay so that's the general gist of how i've sort of classified these things just to give it a little bit of theming so how many features do we have well we got lots so this approximately mimics our menu structure of what we actually have going on here the blue ones are the monkeys, the green ones are the sleuths, the black ones are the headers, and some extra navigation buttons to help me do things a little bit easier. And what I really wanted to sort of go through here is show you some demos of some different pieces that I've actually built along the way here. Some of the, uh, the you know, more, I guess, commonly used features around monkey tools, because there's a lot in here that are, um, are, you know, specific use cases, but there's a lot that are also um, pretty, you know, widely or adapted, I guess, or, or wide use to people. So what I'm going to start with is I'm going to start by going into my what's new block here and just talk a little bit about what's new in monkey tools over the last year. Um, I did just release something about three hours ago, but there's a lot that's actually happened in the last year. And if you're relatively new to monkey tools, you may have missed some of these. So the build number that's listed at the top, 1.0.8332, um, is an old build. Uh, there's been a newer one released about uh, 45 minutes ago. Um, but uh, regardless, as long as you're on this particular build or higher, you will have all of the features that I will actually show you here. 
So the first one is uh, from Table of Range Monkey. This was first released about a year ago. And basically the concept behind this is that it actually replaces the control T functionality in Excel uh, with something that is better because Excel's control T is <clears throat> um, lacking. Okay, If you don't know, control T is the keyboard shortcut to create a table on your data. When it's lacking, well, we'll go and we'll take a look at that. I updated, rewrote the Smart File, Smart Folder Monkey last year as well. Um, this is a, a now a, I'll give you a demo of this one here, but it gives us a lot more comprehensive ability to go and actually pick um, queries that are allow us to smart switch between local and SharePoint folders, as well as gives you an actual entry point into a more efficient SharePoint folder connector than what is served up by default. So this is a uh, the way that SharePoint and folder should actually work. There should be one connector, in my opinion, with one option should be done. There aren't. You actually end up having a matrix of about four different options. Uh, this allows you to navigate through those when you're creating it nice and easy. Uh, I've also mail, uh, put out a bunch of improvements to the BiblioMonkey this year and enhancements as well. Um, for those of you who are new to this one here, the uh, BiblioMonkey is, um, is a library where you can store formulas. Uh, measures, queries, all kinds of different things and re-inject them into workbooks. So it kind of acts as a database library, but in uh, addition to that, you can actually tag items so that they smart replace when you're inserting them. So you can actually build your own sort of really easy to build macros in order to inject new things into your workbook, like maybe Lambda functions and things like that. Um, so some of the big things that I did here is I actually made some of the components of this particular user interface free. Uh, they were paid originally. And I said, you know what? I feel like I want to release that to more people. We added a bunch more tags in the past year. We've added the ability to copy things in directly from the workbook that you're in so you can store them for later. We've made the left pane resizable. Um, I've got a bug on that one that I got to fix, full disclosure, but uh, regardless, I mean, this is some of the cool stuff that we've done. Uh, I've put in a ton of other performance enhancements and general fixes and a ton of bug fixes as well. I'm not going to try and summarize all those because honestly, it would probably take me two days to even figure out all the fixes that I've done in the last year. Uh, but regardless, it's a lot of cool stuff that's actually coming on in this. Now, that's what I did over the last year, except that there's one more thing. I also just released, as of today, a brand new feature called the Modern Pivot Monkey. And this one here is one that I'm going to give you a demo of because nobody's seen this yet, at least not outside my beta testing audience. So let me go back to uh, to this one here, and I'm going to drop over to the modern pivot monkey right off the bat here. We're going to talk about this one first. For all of you who are aware of monkey tools, this is what this one does. Modern pivot monkey is built to allow you to upgrade your classic pivot tables into pivot tables that are backed by the data model. I do a lot of teaching and I will get people that will send me solutions that use pivot tables. And I look at it and go, well, in order to solve the question that you're asking, we actually need a DAX measure. Unfortunately, there's no DAX measures on classic pivot tables. So invariably what that leads to is me having to look at the pivot table and try and figure out how do I turn this thing into a data model? First, I got to figure out where the data source is, and I've got to pull it in through Power Query. Then I've got to load it to the data model. Then I've got to go back and look at the pivot table layout and figure out, hmm, are there calculated columns in this thing here? Is it just regular columns? Then I've got to create DAX measures for each of these things. I've got to replicate the slicers and the timelines and the formatting and all of that before I can then go and actually start looking at the DAX measure that would solve the problem that user asked. And that takes a lot of time. You're typically looking at a minimum investment of somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes minimum in order to actually make that stuff happen. So what the modern pivot monkey does is it actually takes all the legwork out of that for you. Basically, what we do is we create, well, it'll now, it enables you to actually start using DAX measures on your pivot tables, allows you to start manipulating your data through Power Query. Uh, it opens the door to logic expansion as well, because, of course, pivot tables are only based around one table. So if you need to pull in a second table, you got to go data model. This sort of opens that world up so you can then start enhancing things. So what do we actually do with this one here? 
So basically what we do is we actually provide a little dialogue here that identifies all of the classic pivot tables and pivot charts in your workbook. Uh, we convert the pivot table's data source into a power query and we load it to the data model. We do this whether or not it is a standard range, which of course is not what you should be using to serve up your pivot tables, uh, or if it's a regular table that doesn't have a query. If it has a query already, we'll just connect to that. Okay, so um, that's the bonus on those ones. Uh, we then analyze your pivot table configuration. We will then go and create explicit measures for every field that is in the values area. We also will create a, an explicit measure for every single one of the calculated fields that you've created. So you don't have to go and recreate these in DAX, we just do it automatically. And then we recreate your pivot tables and pivot charts as best as we can. Um, for the most part, we're pretty good with this. There's, you know, the more heavily customized you're going to run into some challenges, but I'll show you a demo and show you, uh, you know, some of the stuff that we actually do here. And then finally, we go and create and attach all of your slicers and timelines to it because the challenge is, of course, is that the slicers and timelines that are hooked to your classic pivot tables aren't going to work on your new pivot tables because the data model ones have a different pivot cache. So what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go and pop open a, um, a nice little example here where we can actually take a look at this one. So this one is gonna be this guy here. I'll just uh, get that opening up. Um, all right, so inside this workbook, I'm just waiting for my slicers. There we are, awesome. I wanna just show you on this one right off the bat that there are some things that are not here, okay? So if I head up to monkey tools and I go show queries and connections, you can see that we have no queries. If I go into manage data model, remember I mentioned that I've stolen some buttons here because I'm lazy, I mean efficient, I don't wanna have to switch tabs back and forth. You can see that there's no data model in here, it's empty, okay? So there's no power pivot around this at all. But plainly with my cursor in here and a pivot table analyze tab, this is absolutely a pivot table. We have another pivot table over here, another one here. Sheet one has a pivot chart in it and raw data has a table of data, but obviously not pulled into Power Query. And for reference, that table is called transactions. Okay, nice, helpful, descriptive name. Now, a couple of things I wanna call out about uh, these pivot tables as we look at them. Number one, this one has a slicer on it, which is group. This is linked to this pivot table and this pivot table only. Location is marked as linked. That's because if I click on tax evader and fill this one down, if I go and take a look at report two, you'll notice that it is linked to this pivot table. If I go to the squints, it's changed. If I go back to report one, you can see that it has changed to the squints as well. So these slicers are linked to multiple pivot tables. Nothing else in here is linked. I wanna be clear on that one. You'll also notice my pivot table options Auto fit column widths on update is unchecked on this one here, so it will not be resizing. This guy over here, however, it is not. We also don't have some of our for error values shown in this particular one either. So those are some of the characteristics around pivot tables that I want to look at. So how do I go about using the modern pivot monkey in order to upgrade this so that I can then start writing DAX measures? Well. Oh, I should probably also mention one more thing here before I go on as well. Let's go and take a look at our fields item sets and go into calculated fields. And we'll notice in this area here that we have a total sales. If we pull this one up, oh, there we are. Sales tax in, calculated field that's been written here. Not a very complicated one, but still. Forecasted units, another one as well. So there's two calculated fields here, sales tax in and forecasted units, which are on the pivot table. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Monkey Tools. I'm going to go to the Pivots and Filters menu, and down the bottom here, we'll find our new modern pivot monkey. And when we pop that open, it pops this up and says, all right, cool. We've got three items here that are pivot tables. They're highlighted in light blue. We've got one that's highlighted in light yellow. That's a pivot chart. If I want to upgrade a single one of them, I could, or two of them, I could click on them, hold down Control key, collect multiple ones. I'm not even going to bother with that, though, because I want to get everything. So I'm just gonna click modernize selected pivots. And it says, hey, do you wanna do all of them? You bet I do. And at this point, you can see that it started, it's built the query, okay? So it's pulling this into Power Query now and loading that to the data model. Once it's done with that part, it will then go through and start actually working on building the DAX measures and getting those ready and then starting to replicate all of the pivot tables. 
Some of the key things that are important to recognize about this, I do not modify your original pivot tables in any way. I do not delete them. The reason being is because I want to make sure that I've got everything right before that actually happens. And that's on you to actually take a look at and verify. So let's go back and take a look here. This is the original report one. This is data model report one. So this is the newer version. We can see because it doesn't have the yellow highlighting on it. Notice that it is linked. This drives me crazy. Um, if I go and click on this and unclick or change it here, I can work with this. But for whatever reason, when you build a timeline, it puts half of the thing off the screen and I cannot figure out how to solve that. But regardless, at least it gets it working. So it is working. If I click on it, you can see that we are filtering. That looks nice. We can clear that out. Uh, if I click on tax evader again, it filters the pivot table down here. As we're moving through these, you can see that none of the columns on the left-hand side are changing at all. They're, they're changing um, height-wise, but we're not actually shortening these things down. The pivot table is staying as wide as it is supposed to because we brought over all of the options from the original report here. Okay, so that's kind of a nice, uh, nice component here. Auto fit is turned off. So I'm now filtered to the squints. Let's go look at DM report two. Notice it is also filtered to the squints. If I go back to DM report one now with ethical development, you can see that it is indeed linked here, okay? So that is uh, is working. Hey, thank you, Gidler, I appreciate that. There you go, it is pretty cool, isn't it? Um, so uh, so there we go, so that's, that's working nicely. Um, what is interesting on this one though, if you watch these columns really carefully, particularly right around column C here, if I go and start uh, playing around with these, notice how when I clicked on alcohol, this shrunk down? Well, that's because if we go back and take a look, Auto fit column what updates is checked. So it is going to change that. And we didn't change any of the items that were going on in this area here because that's exactly the way these looked on the original report two. Okay. So there we go. This is exactly the same setup. So I'm leaving these things as much as I can replicating exactly what you actually have in place here. So between these two, the column widths might look a little bit different just based on the way that we filtered them, but that's all good. Report three. Just a regular old pivot table here. There it is, the data model version. It is pulling from the data model. If we go and take a look at this thing here, we can see there's the transactions table with the golden bucket. And this is where all the fields are actually coming from. And look at all those gorgeous explicit measures. Nice, love that. Finally, sheet one, we've got a pivot chart. We should be able to filter this down to look at individual months. Okay, that's awesome, Ken. Well done. Let me just clear that out. Um, that's working the way it's supposed to, but you know, regardless. Uh, let's go back. Actually, I'll tell you what. Let's change this to years. There we go. I'm missing half the data for 2013. Works better when you actually are filtering it to data that actually works. Uh, so there we go. Now, remember, I did just change this. Okay. So this is the original pivot table or pivot chart. And if I go and take a look at the data model-based pivot chart, let's change this to be the same, years. We can now see, if we go in here, You'll actually notice that we don't have the 2013 because in the data model, I actually have control over what the actual calendar is built, which means that it's not going to give me extraneous years for no reason. So that's kind of nice. Um, but here we go. We've got this thing is working quite nicely. We've brought the pivot chart over as well. So this is a really, really quick way to be able to go through and just upgrade your stuff to get it into a new version. If I go and take a look, my raw data table hasn't changed at all. It's still the same old thing, but we've now got our Power Query inside, which means that I can now come in here and I can start carving this up to actually make my dimensions and my fact tables and things like that as I actually need. So um, thank you, Sherry, I appreciate it. I I, I love uh, seeing the, the feedback on this and I'm glad that, uh, that y'all enjoy it. If there's things that you think it should do differently, I'm always curious on these things too, um, especially if you start using it or whatnot. Uh, the one thing I will say on this one is that I have got this one locked as a pro feature. It does work on the free trial for, for the two-week trial. And I don't see this as being something that somebody's going to use every day, to be honest with you. But I think in those scenarios where you do have something that you've been working on, um, hello, Al, welcome. Uh, in, you know, in a scenario where you do have something that you've been working on and, and it is a classic pivot or somebody sent it to you and you go, geez, I really need to upscale this. This just saves a lot of time, right? It just it knocks off a lot of things there. So it's not an everyday feature, but certainly when you need it, it should be able to save you a bunch of extra time uh, in order to get you up and running. 
So, so there we go. There's our brand new feature uh, just released about an hour and a half ago. Um, this is the modern pivot monkey. Uh, it does work. I've tied it on a bunch of different things. It works on simple. It works on more complex. I've had it run through some beta tests. However, having said that, it's always a new feature. If you do ever find, you try it out and you find that something's not working, always remember that there is a log bug right up the top here. And I do take these seriously and try to get them fixed. So uh, just keep that in mind, especially if you're new to monkey tools. Um, you know, I do have bugs because I'm human and I write in software. So there we go. That's the modern pivot monkey, our newest feature. So let me go back to, uh, to my previous deck here. And um, what I'm gonna do is uh, I see Jack's take and comment. So um, as I'm building out my explicit measures, am I modifying the DAX? Well, I'm creating the DAX actually, Jack, because there is no DAX there. Um, so basically when you look at the, um, the basic, you know, if you've got an, exp an implicit measure from a standard pivot table that you've brought in, uh, let's say that you've got you know a table called transactions and you got a column called sales, right? So if I drag sales onto the pivot table, I get sum of sales. What I am doing is I'm looking at what you actually renamed it to start with. So if you've gone and called that sales dollars, I will create you a measure called sales dollars that does a sum of sales transactions. Those those basic aggregations are pretty darn easy. Um, if you start getting into weird things like running totals and things like that, I may not be able to bring those over as easily. Okay, so you should always, you know, this is one of the reasons why I'm not going to delete your original pivot table. I want you to check and make sure that it's okay. Um, if you find things that aren't working in that route, definitely, you know, log bug, let me know. I'll take a look and see if I can fix those things for you. Uh, as far as calculated fields go, um, calculated fields uh, generally can't be overly complex anyway. So I sat down and spent a bunch of time trying to work through what are the operations that we see, what's the, the normal thing, and, and basically um, I've got those things being recreated as well. So it's not modifying any DAX, it's creating DAX is, is basically the, uh, the biggest answer on that one. So hopefully that, uh, that answers the question. Um, as I say, it's not going to answer everything. I know that, um, you know, but I am trying to to at least get, you know, the majority of this thing running forward. And, and certainly, you know, as I hit on monk, uh, running totals, uh, that one definitely is or can be a challenging one in DAX if you if you set those up. Um, I will try and recreate it with a running total standard, but you, that may need some tweaking. And uh, that's the kind of feedback that I'd love to get in the longer term is, hey, my standard pivot table didn't come across correctly. And if you can share me, uh, you know, the, the repro steps for it, that's even better. So um okay let me talk about a couple of the other features and i'm going to go into the um the things around monkey tools that affect a lot of people uh whether or not they're doing dimensional modeling right off the bat although we'll start moving towards that that role as we go so where i'm going to go at this point is i'm going to go and talk about the from table or range monkey now the from table or range monkey is the only feature in here where we actually replace something that Excel does by default. Everything else, we're just adding. This one, I'm overriding their functionality. Why? Because I think that the control T functionality is terrible, okay? And it's not just control T, by the way, all right? It's insert table, formatting as table. So the from table or range monkey, what it actually does, it replaces control T and the get data from table experience. It allows us to actually define tables, named ranges, or dynamic arrays. So you can press Control T and actually define a name for a named range or a name for a dynamic array. Okay, so that takes it up a little bit from what the Excel's default does, which basically just allows you to create tables. It also allows you to have an optional connection only query during creation. And this is kind of nice too, because what I find a lot of the times when I'm going and actually grabbing data and I'm formatting as a table, why am I formatting as a table? So I can suck it into Power Query so that I can then use it for something else, whether I'm merging it to another table or bring it into a data model or things like that. So this allows me to, you know, just speed that process up a little. The important thing about this though, it allows you to name your items before you create your tables and queries. And this is why I am really unhappy with the experience we've had for Control-T since 2007. It's why we've been bringing it up over and over to Microsoft Teams saying this really needs to be fixed. You need to be able to define that name when you create it. This is particularly important if you use get data from table or range, and it's a range of data, what happens by default is that the Excel team's implementation will put a table name on your table, which is helpfully called table one, 
and then suck it into Power Query and make the query against table one. And then when you back uh, go back to Excel and rename that table, it breaks your Power Query. This stops that from happening. Okay, so this is an important factor here. It is also fully functional in a free license. This is something that I believe is so important in the way Excel should work, that if you install monkey tools and do nothing else with it, you'll get this ability. And I have been told by a couple of my clients that they think this is the best darn feature in monkey tools period, which I gotta be honest, it kind of breaks my heart a little because I've worked really hard on all the other features too, but I do appreciate that there's a lot of good stuff in, in what I'm gonna show you right here. Um, we also have configurable defaults because this is really important that if I'm giving you a tool that overrides Excel's native behavior, you need to be able to turn it off easily, okay? And I'm gonna show you where you can do that. There's actually quite a lot of options here. So we can let you use Excel's default behavior. Um, we can turn on or off the connection only query by default. You can even define custom prefaces for the objects that you're creating if you prefer to do that. So you get a lot of, of functionality here. So let me go and uh, pull open my demo workbook for this one here. So this is the, uh, the from table or name uh, monkey we're working with. And I'll just show you really quickly Excel's default behavior that we work with. And I can still replicate that because there's one button that I can't catch. And it's these guys here. So if I go and do this format as table from the home tab and pick a style, this is the default experience that you get. Where is the, tab uh, the data for your table? And does my data have headers? Okay. Now, interestingly enough, this box here doesn't always get checked properly, okay? Particularly, if I go here, it says my data doesn't have headers. That's fine in this case, but what if those are product numbers at the top, okay? So I don't actually think this is correct. I think it should actually always be checked and you should uncheck it where you, where you don't wanna see it, okay? Now, here's the deal. How does this actually work? Like I say, I can't override these buttons, but I can override this one, okay? So let me just go back over here. And you'll see that if we go into this one and press the insert table button, we now get something that it says, would you like to call it table one? Notice it is highlighted. So I can go right away and say, hey, this one here, I wanna call it data, for example, okay? I don't even have to click it, I just type. And at this point, if I'm done, I can just press okay, enter, and it's finished, okay? The fastest way to get to this dialog, control T. Right, control T for table. This is now overriding Excel's default behavior. You can also get there, by the way, with control L for list object, which is what tables were originally called back in 2007. Now, what I've tried to do with this form is make this as efficient as possible. Control T, type a name, hit enter, boom, you're done, if that's all you need to do. Having said that, you also have the ability to go and make other choices here, right? So if I go and say, let's call this one data source, we'll give it a different name. You'll notice that my data has headers. It's picked up the, the name or the range of the data. I also have the ability to create a connection only query. And if I do this, you say, okay, you can see that we pop open the query pane and here's my data source query. And if I jump in here and take a look inside Power Query, if we go back to the source step, you can see that it is targeting the correctly named table. In the Excel world, if you do what I'm about to do, what you would get is you'd get a name called table one. Your original table over in Excel over here would be called table one. You'd have to close this. You'd have to rename the table. That would break your query. So we're trying to deal with that right up front so that never happens. For what it's worth, we also use a smarter data typing algorithm than what Power Query does by standard. One of the things that drives me absolutely insane is that Power Query, if I pull in dates from Excel, which are all whole numbers underneath the scenes, it always marks them as date times. We do smarter than that. We actually look at it and say, hey, if it's got fractions, we'll make it a date time. If it doesn't, we'll make it a date because that's probably what you intended, okay? So we uh, we go through and we fix that. One of the, um, the things that I actually implemented uh, this past year was I managed to cut the uh, time for that change type algorithm down by about 90%. That was one of the, the performance enhancements that actually came out that nobody will ever notice, but I'm super proud of, so. Um, all right, let me go and do another experience to get in here. So we've already seen insert table, control T, Another one is right click and where we can go to get data from table or range. So the intent of course is to pull this into Power Query. I've intercepted this. So you can now come here and say, oh, awesome. So this one here is gonna be my data, right? 
Now you'll notice at this point in time that it says my data has headers. We always check this box. I have been burned far too many times. I want this on more than I want it off. But in this case, maybe I don't like it. So I can obviously uncheck that or I can tab, tab, press space bar. When I'm done with this, I can hit enter. Oh, apparently I can't, my focus isn't there. So if I click okay now, there's gonna be two things that are gonna happen. Number one, we're gonna get a new table that's gonna have headers of column one, two, three. And number two, it's going to launch us right into Power Query so that we can go and make the edits that we want to make. Okay, so I don't even have to go and click on it in the queries pane because the get data experience when you right click on it should take you into Power Query. The big difference, notice, is that this is targeted at my data. The default Excel experience, if you do that, it will create a table called Table 1, and you'll then have to change it after the fact. So this is a much better scenario for making sure that things aren't gonna get broken. All right, let's do a control T on this one. So this guy here, if you actually look up the top here is a shadowed M8 to O12, okay? Every single one of these. And that's because this is a dynamic array. So I've selected this entire block, I've hit entered and it's spilled. I can prove that by putting something in to block the spill range, but there you go. So that's a dynamic array. Now. We can pull these into Power Query as well. You can do that with a get data. You can do that with whatever you like. I'm gonna go name this right now, okay? And you'll notice that we actually identified that this is a named range. Now, arguably you could convert this to table if you want. I don't recommend you do that because it is a dynamic array. So I'm gonna go back to named range, but I do wanna call out here that with our original ones, we could have set it up as a named range right off the bat. This is also a big benefit because when you grab data using the get data, right click from Excel, Power Query, the way that they implemented this, they will never let you create a named range. They will always force you to create a table. So we say, no, no, no. You know what? You might want to create a named range. We're going to let you do that. You can define the scope. Is it workbook? Is it worksheet level? Again, this is highlighted because it's an array. We have marked it with ARY here, but notice we've highlighted the entire thing. So I can call this one DIN ARY. Uh, ARY uh, data one, I'm gonna call it, just for the name of it. Notice it's picking up the dynamic array with the hashtag reference there, so that's cool. What I'm gonna do right now is create my connection only query as well. So it's gonna name it and it's gonna pull it in. And we can see again, we actually have the name of the dynamic array that I've created. Okay. Does it actually work? Well, let's go find out. Let's go and say, hey, uh, right click. Uh, we're gonna insert a table row above this. Looks like I've got some new data here. If I go in and take a look, do my zeros show up? Let's refresh that preview. There they are. Okay, so the dynamic array is expanding correctly as it is supposed to do. And that's not me adding new functionality to Excel. That's the way it's supposed to work. My big thing here is just naming it and bringing the query in properly. Now I wanna show you some options here around this because again, I am overriding Excel's behavior and I wanna make sure that you know you have the ability to turn these things off. Uh, this is why we have an options monkey here. And in the options monkey under global options, this top block here is all for the table arrange monkey. If you'd like to use Excel's default table arrange experience, maybe you prefer it. I can't think why you would. Maybe you're recording a video for someone, okay? Or teaching, that might be a reason why you can actually just go and check that box and it will now default back to Microsoft's option. I'm not gonna do that. Default insert table button that I started with there. You can use the default control T or control L and you can toggle these individually, which is kind of nice. So if you wanna just keep the you know control L shortcut around for the classic, you can do that. Uh, do you want that query check box checked for the always create a connection only query? Uh, interestingly enough, when I first put this out, I actually checked that box by default. I've turned that off since because there are a lot of times where you don't want that to happen. Uh, but here's the thing I wanna show you right now is I'm gonna go and preface this with DYN. Okay, so for a new dynamic array, I want this to start off as DYN. I can also, a lot of people like to preface their tables with TBL. So here we go. I can set these up say close. If I now go and say control T on my dynamic array, notice that it is now prefaced with DYN. And more importantly, we did not highlight the whole thing. The cursor is after it. So you can just type the name of your dynamic array to call it whatever you actually like along the way. Okay. So 
I'm trying to really think through this to make sure that this form is as efficient as possible for people along the way. Uh, if I were to go in and, uh, and create, uh, like I say, a new table right now, notice that it is prefaced TBL1, so I can just type whatever I actually want for the name of this thing, and that TBL is right there up front. Okay. Now, I'm going to go and just reset my options on this one. Back to global options. We'll get rid of these two because I prefer to not have them prefaced. So there we go. Um, so that that is the from table or range monkey. Like I say, this uh, this is um, it automatically happens for all users, whether you're on a free or a pro license. Uh, it automatically takes over that behavior. Um, you can turn it off if you like. Those options are available to you, whether you're on a free or a pro license. Uh, but I have been told by some people that think this is just absolutely amazing and saves them a ton of time. And it's just such a simple thing. And in my opinion, this is what the from table experience, get data experience should look like uh, right off the bat. So um, I don't know if there's any questions on that one at all. If there are, by all means ask. Um, but outside of that, I'm going to, uh, to hop into another uh, demo of something different here. So let me just close this one. I don't see any questions coming in. Uh, and I'm going to go back over here and I want to talk about um, another big feature that we actually have, um, which is the Biblio monkey. So I'm going to hop over and talk about this one a little bit. Zach, I see your question coming, so I'm just watching for that as well. Um, and I can probably pick it up when we go through and, uh, and deal with uh, BiblioMonkey stuff, I'm sure. All right, BiblioMonkey. So what is the BiblioMonkey? Biblio uh, being French, I believe, for uh, Bibliotech um, Library um, also exists in other languages. The idea here is all about storing Excel items for later recall. I know a lot of people who have a notepad document with key things that they store in and they open up the notepad formula copy back and forth with lambda functions it might be a workbook and whatnot um oh will i be discussing about interactivity with power bi uh, i certainly can uh, zach i'll do that uh, closer to the end actually sure um all right so the concept behind biblio monkey is that it provides you the ability to store a whole uh, notepad plus yeah notepad plus plus is fantastic um but not as a library for all the things that you need to use in Excel, Sherry. That's the thing, right? Like, it's great for certain purposes. I love it for find and replace. Like, that's my favorite thing. But, you know, if I'm trying to, to build a library of things that I might want to use in different solutions over time, it's not my favorite thing to do. So BiblioMonkey was originally built to store queries, measures, and Excel formulas. We've expanded it to also do Lambdas, VBA, Office scripts, and Python formulas. Um, Every one of these, except for VBA and Office scripts, can be re-injected into your workbook and tagged with variables so that they prompt you for replacement when you're actually injecting them. Um, as a pro tip on this one here, if you store your database in a OneDrive sync folder, you can share it across multiple machines completely for free. Okay, so this is what I actually do. Every one of my uh, my devices has access to the exact same BiblioMonkey database, so it doesn't matter if I'm on my desktop or on my laptop. So, oh, personal workbook, yeah. So personal workbook works for macros. I I build add-ins because you know I'm that guy. Um, but regardless, yeah, it's uh, it's a neat place to to be able to actually have these things in a in a better format and. Sherry, since you say personal workbook, I, I have this feeling that at some point in time, I'm going to get a feature request from you say, hey, I'd really like to be able to inject VBA directly into my stuff. Uh, that's not available yet. If I get enough requests for it, it's something that I will look at. Okay, so, um, so the concept here is that items can be inserted into other workbooks on demand, uh, variable tags prompt for contextual replacements. And um, the big thing you want to know is that the behavior copy versus inject uh, is based on the item and the license type. Some of these things will only let you inject them on a pro license. Uh, so you can do the copy and paste yourself manually. Uh, most of them don't, though. They're, they'll go along the way. Uh, but there are certain ones that will only actually have um, places where you can inject them based on your license. So let's go take a look at the uh, BiblioMonkey. I'm going to start with a simple example of this one here, which is um, a basic one that basically anybody can use if you work with formulas, okay? So the first thing that I wanna call out here is that I have a forecast that I'm building for revenues, okay? It's a standard financial modeling style stuff. Uh, what you'll notice over here is that I've got a horrible, ugly divide by zero error. Now we all know, of course, how we should handle a divide by zero error. We should actually be testing whether or not the denominator is zero. And if it is, we should not be dividing by it. However, we're going to do what you shouldn't do, which is wrap it in an if error function to take care of it. But here's the problem. 
what I really want to do is I want to do all these formulas. And we think, oh, well, that's okay, Ken, no problem. We're smart, right? We can hold down our control key and we can grab these formulas because all these formulas are the same. Until we get to that one, which is a subtotal and not the same as what we had before. And this is another subtotal. Sorry, my laptop decided to just connect to my headset again. So, um, so here we go. So these ones again are all rounding functions. This one here is another subtotal, and this one's just a basic sum. And I want to wrap all of these. Excuse me, my uh, my um, my laptop upstairs likes to uh, every now and then reconnect to my headset, and drives me crazy because it actually cuts me off when it does it. So, at any rate, the big challenge I have here is I've got three different structures of formula, and I want to put an if error function around all of them. How do you do that quickly and efficiently? And the answer is you use monkey tools. So here's the deal. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start off by building one that works. So we'll say if error comma zero. There we go. That looks much nicer than hash div zero. I'm gonna copy this formula, okay? I know how it works, I understand it, this is important. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna to go to monkey tools and I'm gonna jump into the Biblio monkey and this will open up my database. And when you open your database for the first time, it will be completely empty. Why? Well, because I want everything in here to make sense to you. Okay, that's where the real strength of this coming in. I have had some requests to precede it with certain things. I'm really struggling with whether or not I want to do that, though, because I'm concerned that that may actually end up taking away from the ability to really understand what's going on in here. So let me start with this, though. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add myself a new formula into the Biblio Monkey. And this formula here is going to be if error, oops, if error zero is what I'm gonna call it, because I might actually make multiple things here, okay? So the concept is wrap cell contents in if error. Let me just go and paste this in here. Uh, I have gotta figure out how to get the font size to actually go and work properly for me right off the bat, but you'll notice that I've just pasted the formula in, so that's all good. And now what I want to do is I wanna look at this piece right here, all the way up to that comma because I actually want to apply this not to that specific formula when I recall it. What I want to do is say right click, add new prompt, and I'd like to replace the internals with the cell contents. Okay, that puts in this funky little text here, PCFX1 cell contents. Okay, what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna say save. And you'll see that we now have a new formula called if error zero. I am now going to grab all of these guys here. I'm going to right click, insert from BiblioMonkey, formula, if error zero. Now they're all zero, but did it work? So this one is a rounding, rounding. There's my subtotal. There's another subtotal that's been wrapped in if error. These ones are all rounding, subtotal, and there's that you know super complicated. Um, subtraction that we actually have in there. So super fast. Now in my personal database, I've got an if error zero, if error blank, um, you know, other different error tests that I might want in certain cases, because, you know, I might pick up a workbook and realize I got a bunch of cube functions there. Cube functions can obviously go sometimes and, and hand out an NA result or something like that. So I might want to go and actually check, you know, how that looks. Maybe I got a bunch of X lookups or, or V lookups that are returning an, an NA. I might want to wrap them in if NA. So this allows us to actually go and do that really, really quickly. And it's now stored for any workbook that I ever use. Uh, let me go to the cost and revenue page here. Um, so this is a format of a particular statement that I use uh, when I'm trying to go and build things to do budgeting forecasts for the next year. So the concept behind this is that I have for 2022, 3,575 units that I have, and I wanna increase this by 10%. Where you don't see one of these things though, I actually wanna increase it by a global override factor. So it's gonna be 5% across the board unless I have specifically stated otherwise. And there's a formula for that, but I don't wanna to have to write this every time. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grab all these cells, right click, insert from BiblioMonkey formula. I'm gonna use this volume forecast with override formula that I've defined. 
Now this has got multiple tags in it and I'm gonna show you what it does a little bit later, but you'll notice that these things are all set up with a mixture of referencing because of the tags that I've chosen. The global increase comes from here. The monthly override is this one here, that's the percentage, and the volume is this guy here. Every one of these tags is wording that I chose when I set this up. I now click inject and boom, the formula's in place. And what do I actually have here? I've got this, there's all the variables that have been dropped inside this particular formula. Now you look at that and go, wow, that's pretty gross and ugly. It's a let formula, right? There's a let, there's the defining of the first term, the value, the defining of the second term, the value, defining of the third term, the value, and the actual function itself that I'm actually using. So how did I actually build this one here? What does it look like inside BiblioMonkey? Well, I built it in Excel first to test it. I copied it into BiblioMonkey. And then I went through and said, for the first cell reference, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna choose, I want a fully absolute reference. And you'll notice that when you're actually doing this, you actually have fully absolute, absolute column, relative row, absolute or relative column, absolute row, fully relative. We got worksheet names, qualified references as well. So there's all kinds of different pieces. So qualified reference, by the way, is worksheet um, followed by cell. Okay, so worksheet bang cell. So all of those items. What's really cool about these though too, and you're gonna see this when we get into our measure later on, is that as soon as you add a prompt, you can reuse it multiple times, which means that even if the same number shows up multiple times, you can actually refer to it and you only have to enter it once, okay? So it's kind of a neat little thing here. Now let me show you another way to get things in here because this is also kind of cool as well, is that there's a specific function inside this workbook that you don't know about. It's a Lambda function. Let me go and prove that out right now. We can go formulas, name manager, and here is my Lambda function. You can see it starts with equals Lambda, called the worksheet name. And the way that worksheet name works is, this is a text that says the budget worksheet for the fiscal year. Oh, hang on a second, that's not the right one. Let me go back to, let me just go and pull it in like this. Equals worksheet name, there's my Lambda, A1, and we're on the cost and revenue worksheet, okay? so. I might want that Lambda in another workbook, all right? Now, Notepad++ is a great place to store this kind of stuff, except that wouldn't it just be easier if it was right in Excel, right? So I'm gonna go add new. I'm gonna choose to add a Lambda and I'm gonna add it from my existing solution. Here it is, that's the Lambda. I'm gonna hit save. My Lambda is now inside my BiblioMonkey. It's ready for me to use whenever I want to use it in future. So this is the basics of BiblioMonkey. The main thing that I want you to recognize is from a formula standpoint, these things are always available to recall from this area here for everybody, okay, all users. Um, Power Query is one that you would have to copy in yourself if you're not in a pro license, but for a pro license user, we will let you inject your Power Queries right from here. You don't even have to open BiblioMonkey. And as you're gonna see, if you're a pro user, you can also inject measures from here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go and flip over to another BiblioMonkey example here and show you how this one works. We're gonna move into something that actually uses the data model. I'll show you a little bit more stuff that's going on here. Um, but before I actually go into that, what I actually just wanna call out real quickly here is this says you are here and notice it says equals name and it's calling the worksheet name function. This workbook does not include the Lambda. At least it will in a second though. Insert from BiblioMonkey, let's go and insert our Lambda worksheet name, inject, boom, there we go. This is the sales versus budget worksheet. This one here, which also uses the Lambda, the unit sales. Okay, super fast, because I've built Lambdas that I know what they are, and I can inject them whenever I want, which is pretty great, okay? So Lambda's in. Let's go and take a look at some of the other stuff that we got here. So we have a data model inside this one, okay, with lots of different tables here, but I actually wanna focus right now on this one here. This is Loaded Pencil. This is the database that I use in my training courses, okay, and it lives in SQL Azure. It lives on a server called xlgdemos.database.windows.net. It is called Loaded Pencil, and it does have security on it that you need to know the password to get into it, okay? Join a course and I'll even share that with you. So here's the deal. 
There's a piece down here called Sys Database Firewall Rules. It shows up in an Azure database. I'm going to filter that out. It shouldn't be there. Honestly, Microsoft should be dealing the filter for me. But regardless, I'm going to take care of it. So I have these two rows inside this, right? This builds me a query, which in M code looks like this, okay? Nicely indented in one of our other features called the query sleeve. Now, I want this, but I want to be able to use it on other databases because of course I have other databases on that database server. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to BiblioMonkey, add new. I'm just gonna hop straight into solution here without even defining a type. And you'll notice that I can bring in queries, measures, and Lambda functions, which already exist in this one here. I'm gonna grab my loaded pencil here and I'm gonna rename this right now. I'm gonna call this one Azure DB. This is connection to Excel Guru Azure database. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab this guy right here, right click, add new prompt, text, enter database name. Say okay. Nothing in here has changed yet, okay? I haven't changed this at all. I'm gonna hit save. Now, here's my Azure DB. It's now tagged to enter the database name. I can do what I'm about to do from here, just with inject, or I can right click in a cell and inject it from here, okay? Either one will work. I'll just do it from here. And it says, what would you like to call this? I'm gonna go and call this one Adventure Works. Oops. The old standard database that everybody knows. We're going to enter the database name here and say inject. And by the way, I forgot to mention, I have this declared here as to where it will actually load to as well. So it can load to connection to the database or not. If we now, I'm just going to exit that, hop into the AdventureWorks query. What I want to show you is that this is the AdventureWorks database. This is the loaded pencil database. So the only difference between these two things, of course, is What's the database that I'm actually calling here? But this is pretty cool. And this works for basically anything that you've got text-based, right? I've just happened to be reusing a query. I store tons of power queries for data sources that I connect to on a regular basis. My sales database, my finance, you know, my HR database, like all these different things. I now have them stored as queries so that I can always kick up a new workbook, just inject the query, and then I can start doing the things that I need to do. So it just saves me a little bit of time along the way. Okay, so Power Queries can absolutely be stored inside there, can absolutely be tagged as well. Now, I'm going to do a couple more things inside the database here as well. We go to Add New. I'm going to show you another little template here. So let's go to Solution, and I'm going to find a measure, this one called Variance Dollars. Let's go and call this one Difference Whole Number. Now, I hope that everybody can recognize right off the bat that this is not a very complicated measure, right? We're just subtracting one thing from another. If we're at all used to writing in DAX, we're gonna be pretty happy and pretty comfortable with writing something like this, but check this out. Let's see what, where this one goes. So I'm gonna go add new prompts. I'm gonna choose measure. These are all contextual to Power Pivot, by the way. Okay, everything here. So I'm gonna choose measure and I'm gonna say uh, choose first measure. And then I'm going to grab this one over here. I need to figure out how to get this to stop on automatically selecting the entire word. I, whoever invented that feature was just evil. Uh, choose second measure. Go. I'm going to define this to be a number. We're going to leave it as a whole number. That's fine. And I'm going to choose save. Okay. Just want to check something here real quick too and see if, yeah, that's okay. Um, all right. Now. I'm also gonna build another one because I've got another pattern in this that's kind of interesting too. So if I go back to solution, this burger sold units here is a calculate statement. Notice that it calculates a measure and it sets a column equal to a specific textual value. So let's try this one here. We're gonna call this one calculate measure where column equals text. And you can put in a, a more accurate description for what you're dealing with here. But here's the interesting part, right? So I can come back here and I can say, all right, let's go grab this, right click, add new prompt, measure. Choose base measure. This guy here, I need a fully qualified table column reference. 
So I'm going to go add new prompt. We're going to go look for qualified column any. And we're going to say uh, choose column. And over here, where we've got burgers between our quotes, we're going to go right click, add a text based prompt here to say value to match. Okay, so I've basically now turned this whole thing here into tags, except for the calculate that surrounds it all. I'm going to define this one here as a whole number, 1,000 separator. That's all good. We'll hit save. Okay, now before I leave here, <clears throat> I want to show you one more measure. Okay, and it's this one here called X months prior. This measure is obviously much bigger. Okay, it's indented. You can see what's going on in it. But what I want you to notice is there's a var, var statement at the top that has a tag for the number of months to subtract. We use a start of month with a date add. We've got a last date. And in here, it asks me to select the calendar date key. I picked this tag up via calendar primary key. Okay, so this is the primary key of the calendar table. I'm reusing my variable from up above. This is just DAC stuff. Okay, notice again. This is the exact same tag as we have right here. And it shows up again down here, right? So this tag shows up three times. And here's another one for measure to adjust. I can find all those a little bit faster though by going use existing prompt. And you can see that we actually have these three things. So if I wanted to say, use the existing prompt here, I could just go right click, use existing prompt, and it's gonna drop that in place for me. Now, I wanted to show you this because this is going to come in as I start playing around and using these things to actually build some things out. Okay, so again, the whole concept here is that I don't want to write this every single day. In my self service BI Academy, I actually provide my students with about an 80 page ebook of DAX patterns for different date periods. In this case here, this one's all parameterized, so I don't even have to go back to the book to copy anything. Okay, and you'll see how that works in just a second here. So let me close uh, out the original uh, workbook here and go back to the one that I'm actually hoping to work on. There we are. So here's my standard sales versus uh, budget pivot table. I'm not really worried about playing around with this guy here at all. It's just sort of there for a demo to show you that we do actually have some, some stuff in place. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to hop over to unit sales. So what if I want a, well, I'm just going to show you really quick. Here's the basic variance that I built, which was the subtraction between sales and budget, okay? Over here, I've got unit sales. And I have two things that I've got in this case here. I've got my sales units and I've got burger sold, which was the other template that I copied to build that tagged calculate. This one here, the concept is that we're overriding our filter context so that we're always using burgers. So we can see burgers on every single line. So if I want a difference of units versus the burger units, just to see, you know, how it's actually shaking up one way or another, I can do this. Right click, insert from Biblio Monkey. We're going to go to measure. This will only show up here, by the way, if you're on a pro license. Otherwise, you have to uh, do your injections or copies from inside the um, Biblio Monkey itself. Okay, this is a convenience feature for the pro license users. And what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to start with a difference whole number. And I'm going to create something here that says uh, burgers versus all sales. I'm going to store this on the sales table. The first measure that I'm going to work with is going to be my sales units. And the second measure that I'm going to work with here is going to be my burgers sold in units. Okay, So I get to just go and select this from the fields that we actually have in place. This brings up only measures in this dialog because I tagged it with measures. This one here is going to bring up only tables because that's where you have to store a measure. So I'm going to say inject. I'm going to come over here, and I'm going to drop it on the pivot table. You can now see the difference between burgers and burgers, zero, the difference between everything else is calculated. And it's a whole number. Okay, So I'm just reusing a very simple DAX measure in this case, but at least I don't have to go and write it. Let's do another one. Right click, insert. We're going to go back down, grab a measure here. And this one, I'm going to use a calculate. So this is my simple calculate filter. I'm going to go and grab all this stuff here, and I'm going to call this one. We're going to go with sandwiches sold. We'll store this on the sales table. The base measure, again, is going to be sales units. We need a column here. This is going to be on my categories table, the category column. And again, just to show you this stuff, these are measures. These are my qualified columns inside the data model. 
Okay, so you don't see any measures in this. You don't see any table names. You see fully qualified columns. It's going to bring back the right format. The value that I want to match here, sandwiches. Say inject. If I go back to my pivot table, boom, there we go. Let's just check. Sandwiches is here, 75,318 on every single row. So that calculate is working. Would you use this in this particular scenario? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what you're actually trying to do. But the key part here is that I don't have to write the calculate function anymore. I can just go and grab one that's actually in place there and make it nice and easy, which is really nice. All right. Let me show you one more. We're going to show you the complicated measure. Okay. Remember the one that had multiple tags in it. So over here, I've got my sales for May. Month to date, quarter to date, year to date. I don't really care about those. Down the bottom here, for the same year, I'm actually listing off the sales by month. Notice 19,911 is what we actually have for a grand total for May. If I change this to June, we're now at 18,719, which matches here. What I'm going to inject at this point in time is I'm going to inject a measure for X months prior. So this is going to be my sales units one month prior okay i'm going to store this on the sales table because that's where i generally tend to store my measures and i'm going to subtract one month from it select the calendar date key that's it i don't need to do anything else with it as a matter of fact you can't because there is only one primary key for the calendar table so by choosing the correct tag it gives me the right um, right value and then what's the measure that I actually want to adjust on this one here? I'm going to go with sales units. Okay. So these are all of the components that go into that incredibly long DAX formula. And when I hit inject, and go and add sales units one month prior, is it working? Well, if we're on June 18719, this one's giving 19911. That looks like it's working. If I go to July, this is now pulling up the 18719. Now, this is kind of nice for when you're injecting one measure at a time. But what if I need a two months prior and three months prior? Do I really want to go through, right click, and insert? One of the challenges I have here that I've sort of identified that I need to figure out on this one, and I've thought about this one, and I'll get your feedback on this one actually from right now. When you right click on the pivot table itself, my BiblioMonkey doesn't show up on this, and I believe it should. I need to figure out how to make that happen. I also am feeling that if you select inside a pivot table and inject something with the BiblioMonkey, I think it should automatically add it into the pivot table. It should automatically put it on the field list. And if you agree with that, please let me know. If you think that that's a horrible idea, please also let me know because obviously it all takes dev time to do it. Um, but here's the deal. I want to make a two months prior. Okay, so I'm going to just grab this. I'm going to go home. We're going to wrap text so we can hopefully see this a little bit. I want to put a two-month prior and a three-month prior next to this. So I'm going to use a different tool for this. This is a tool called DAX Sleuth. And when I hop into DAX Sleuth, we actually have a dependency tracer for your measures. Okay, you can see here's the one month prior. It references sales units. And this is the signature of what actually got built. Remember, it was originally pulled from BiblioMonkey prompted to, in order to put in the one and choose the calendar date columns and the sales unit measure. And I like this, but I now want to create one that goes back two months. It's easy to do, right? I just got to change this number, but here's a cool thing. Duplicate. What would you like to call this duplicated measure here? I'm going to go and call this duplicated measure sales units two months, oops, months prior. Now, it's going to create the measure, and this is where I realized that I forgot to actually update the number two. So I'm just going to go two and hit update. There we go. So that sales month or sales unit is two months prior. I can now also do this three, if I do it in the right order, duplicate sales units three months prior. So now three months prior shows up with a three in place already. Two months prior, one month prior. Not a lot of difference between these. Uh, is it really creating calculation groups? Uh, I mean, we don't have calculation groups in Excel. So 
Kind of. I mean, the the concept that I'm dealing with on this is that I may have a reason for doing this. Um, if I'm building a forecasted actuals table, uh, I might have something that's only slightly different. If you actually come to my um, building uh, building um, the financial statements in Power Pivot course that I have at SkillWave, we actually teach you how to build these things, and there are 12 different measures for the different periods. Uh, but you'll see here that um, that with these things done, quickly going and recalculating these things, or quickly going and um, and adding these additional measures into uh, this format, I've now got my one, my two, then my three months prior. And if you look at these going backwards, there's 18, 7, 1, 9, 19, 11, 10, 26. So again, this is all about duplicating things really quickly, right? You can also use that same thing, for example. Hang on a second. Come on. There we go. You can also use the same thing if we wanted to have another sales category, right? We've got... Uh, what do we have here? We've got burgers sold. Uh, in this case, we got sandwiches sold. If we wanted draft beer, for example, we could go and say, hey, you know what? I want this one here to be draft beer and duplicate. And we're going to call this one sales or we'll call it draft sold. Draft sold. I should probably put units after it as well. And it just allows us to very quickly go through and add these other components in without having to go back into Power Pivot, without having to go into the Manage Measures dialog, New Measures, without having to remember what the formatting was on things because it's actually going and copying all these things. By the way, there's no draft sold in food. Let's go and look at alcohol. There it is, right? So it makes it a lot easier to go through and, and deal, with, uh, deal with different things. But while I'm in here, and showing you Dax Luth, I also want to show you something else that's really cool about this. Sales units is one of my most used measures here. How do I know that? Well, because I wrote all this stuff, right? But how would you know that? Well, if you click on it, check this out. This is where sales units is actually used. It's used on this pivot table, and this pivot table, and this pivot table. And in this OLAP formula, and in this one, and this one, and this one, and so forth. If it's in named ranges, it'll tell you there as well. If it's used in pivot charts, it'll tell you there as well. Or sales used. Sales is only used on one pivot table. There you go. Here's the DAX formula for it, by the way. Um, you know, so it's it's kind of a neat uh, neat little thing when you look at these that you can actually flip back and forth and figure out where things are going. And there's other tools to help you do uh, better things along this as well, as far as audit and stuff like that. But this is the main components I really wanted to show around uh, BiblioMonkey, just as the as far as how the use cases of this goes, is that what I've just done here is that um, I've shown you that BiblioMonkey can be really useful for somebody who doesn't work in Power Query or Power Pivot at all. BiblioMonkey can also be immensely useful for people that actually work inside Power Query and Power Pivot. We can store our formulas, we can store our measures. Uh, I do want to just call this one out because, um, again, I know that uh, the Sherry is working with VBA. I mean, we do have the ability to store VBA. Again, we don't have the ability to inject VBA, but this does act as a better code library, if you will, than, um, than if you're working with something like Notepad++. The other thing that's super nice about BiblioMonkey is that this window here stays on top of Excel. So if we now go over to Excel and press Alt F11, it will actually bring this one up. I can hop over, I can grab whatever code I have, Alt Tab back over here and paste it. Or if you have two monitors, of course, you can actually move these things side by side. Now this does stay, as I say, on top of the Excel window. The VBA window is different, but I can actually go and uh, set these things up side by side so I can copy from one place to another. I don't have to close things and whatnot. Sherry has four monitors, show off Sherry. Wow, I got three here. You're outdoing me on this one. Um, unless I start adding laptops and and um, and phones and whatever else, I can come up with six panes of glass altogether. But um, but there you go. So some kind of some cool things there. So like I say, if I get enough requests for it, I'll probably look at doing things like injecting directly from VBA. The problem is there's a lot of work that I got to do in order to make that work. But the nice thing about this is it stays with your computer, right? And it syncs across individual computers. So it's a, it's a pretty handy thing that uh, that we have in those cases. Um, all right, let me let me head back to uh, let me head back over to my deck. So, <laughs> I mean, this is the fantastic thing about Monkey Tools is that we've been talking so far. I've been talking for an hour, and I have shared with you the modern Pivot Monkey from Table Arrange and the Biblio Monkey. There's a lot of other features that are going on in this. So I'm not going to have time to show all of these to you today, but I do want to just call out some of the things that we have in this area. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Power Query parameter table that, it was, uh, that is illustrated in MS for Data Monkey or Master Your Data. 
we have the ability to inject that parameter table in about two seconds flat. So if you go and you take a look at monkey tools and go to the query monkey and parameter table and function, this will actually inject it in your workbook with a formula that drives you back to the path of where this workbook is actually saved, what the workbook's name actually is and the specific name here as well. We do have the ability to also go and run a smart folder monkey which allows me to look at this stuff and say, hey, you wanna pull a files list from here, okay? Um, the interesting thing about this is that if you use files list, we're gonna create a query that pulls from this folder and we're gonna use the default behavior that comes from file from folder. Now, this smart switches between local and SharePoint, okay? That's something that takes a lot of work if you don't have to do it. Like you might set it up against a local folder. If the file path comes back as SharePoint, it blows it up. You got to refix it and everything else, which is a pain. The challenge with this though, from SharePoint folder is really slow because it enumerates every single file and every single subfolder on your entire system. If you don't want to do that, you can show the files in subfolders only. And what happens here is that it actually doesn't show you the other 40,000 files that are in your folder system, it only shows you the files that are stored in this specific local folder. Now I do have to define my privacy levels. We can't get away from that. That's just a power query thing. And we also, once we get there, I may have to authenticate here. I'm not sure. Nope, there we go. So this is actually giving me the files that live in this folder on my computer and it gives me a table if I'm looking for individual things. So if I wanna go, for example, into my Power BI models folder, I don't have to enumerate the 40,000 folders that are files and folders that are stored on this site. I can actually just go and drill into just the PBI models folder and see what I actually have in this. So it's very, very quick, okay? So this is a nice little feature called Smart Folder Monkey. We also have a Smart File Monkey that allows you to actually you know, deal with file paths that change for files as well. So. That's one of the other areas that I did some work on here. We got custom date functions. We have a table monkey to pull multiple tables into the data model very quickly. A calendar monkey to build you dynamic calendars that always refresh based on your data so they're never short. Uh, if you have ever worked inside dimensional modeling and you've come up against the issue where you have a, uh, um, you've got a table that you built up and suddenly it turns into a many-to-many -many relationship, maybe your customer moves so they now have two entries. The SCD2 will help you build a slowly changing dimension table as well. Uh, so that's a really cool little wizard there. Destination Sleuth shows you where all your queries load, so you can change multiple query load destinations at once. The Query Sleuth I did show you really quickly. I'll just hop back in there and just call this one out again, but uh, Query Sleuth allows us a full dependency tracer for your queries that are inside your workbook, so you can see where they all go, where they come from. Uh, you can even see the M code and make light edits if you're into M code editing as well. It's similar to the DAX Sleuth in its functionality, but for power queries. Um, We've got the ability to create measures. We've got the ability to time queries. There's all kinds of cool things that are going on. But I'm gonna round out this demo today with this one here, import from Power BI, because uh, I think Zach had, had asked me on this one here um, uh, as well. So uh, Zach, you're asking, if a workbook is shared with outside stakeholder who doesn't have monkey tools installed on their computer, would that be a problem? I mean, it's a problem. They don't have monkey tools installed on their computer because everybody should and it's free, right? But no, it's not a problem. Honestly, and this is, like I said, right at the very beginning, my philosophy is the person that's building the model is the person that should have monkey tools installed. The person that's using the model doesn't need it. There is nothing that monkey tools does that creates a hook that requires a monkey tools license. Anything you build with monkey tools will work in plain vanilla Excel. Okay. That is one of the number one things that I am really, really, really uh, concerned about when I build these things. I never want to put you into a licensing hook. I want you buying my tool because you need it, not because somebody else built a model with it, okay? So I hope that's clear enough on how important that is to me in the grand scheme of things. Uh, all right, let me talk about this one, the import monkey. Zach asked a question about working with Power BI. Uh, my philosophy generally when I'm building models is I build in Excel first and then publish to Power BI. There are occasions where I will build something in Power BI desktop and invariably every time I've done that, I'm like, darn, they need this model back in Excel. Now there's an import from Power BI to import an Excel model with Power Query and Power Pivot, but there's no tool to come backwards. At least 
there is a tool to come backwards. It's called monkey tools. Okay. So this is the very understated and not so sexy user form that goes with it. And basically what it does, it will import your Power BI model and it'll give you a nice little report of the things that we could not do because there always are things that we can't do because the Power BI version in Excel or in Power BI, sorry, the data model version in Power BI is about three versions ahead of what Excel is. So calculation groups we can't do. Um, we can't hide columns and things like that, uh, but we can do an awful lot. And I'm gonna show you uh, right now, I'm gonna hop over and just uh, grab the demo file of this one here. Uh, actually, I don't even need to do that. Let me just go and, and hop over to Excel here. We'll go File, New, Blank Workbook. I'm gonna go to Monkey Tools, Import, Export, and I'm gonna import a BI model to Excel. I'm gonna import from a Power BI model. Okay, so it's gonna go and it's gonna ask me where, uh, where do I actually find these? So let me just drop a file path in here and find a Power BI model. Let's go grab LP Azure SQL. So it's gonna go and connect to the file. Okay, obviously it's gotta open Power BI in order to do this. Okay, so, uh, but as soon as it gets a connection, Power BI doesn't even have to completely load. Um, the user interface can take a little while here to do that. But uh, what we'll see is that at some point here, it's gonna kick off and it's gonna say, hey, cool, we've identified that there are some challenges in what we actually have going on here. Uh, your table metrics was not generated by Power Query. Somebody just created a new table, which means that it can't be imported. But what we can do is we can say we can generate the missing table with Power Query. So we leave this option checked by default. You can bring in just the queries, you can bring in the data model, you can bring in the queries and the model. We also encourage you to add error handling to this as well. This is really important because if I bring a table over and it doesn't load for privacy reasons or anything else like that, that would actually block me from creating measures because I need to have the columns. This adds a blank wrapper around everything so that even if the data doesn't load right away, we still get a fallback of columns. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hit import. And you can see that this is starting to go through and import all of the queries. And then it will start working through the other components like measures and build relationships and do all of the kind of cool things that are needed for a Power BI model in order to make it sing. So um, we just have to be a little bit patient as it goes through and does its work here. Okay, so um, for reference, this will import PBIX files. I do not work with PBIT uh, um, types yet. Uh, that is something that uh, I will eventually get to, um, but have not yet. Um, so connection has to be with PBIX. Yes, uh, is it possible to connect with tab or through tabular through app? No, it's not, not at this point in time. Um, uh, you know, I've I've looked at that, Zach, I've thought about it, but you know, the, the question that I really have to ask at, at, you know, for the most part is, is there a reason why my main user, user base would actually need this? And that's the, the big thing, because there's a lot of development work that goes behind it. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really, I, I question how many people would actually want to do that from Excel. If you've got good use case reasons for it, I'd definitely like to know for sure. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when I've got people who are already working in Power BI, uh, they tend to end up being Power BI people. So, um, so for reference, the import of this has been done. Let me just go and show you what this actually looks like. So this is the original Power BI file, okay? If I go and take a look at the data model, uh, you can see, here we go, this is the data model that we actually have here. So there's multiple tables, disconnected measure, or metrics table over here. Uh, there's lots of measures that are going on, on on the metrics table as well. And if I go and uh, hop back into the transform data, um, what you'll see in here is, of course, we have the Power Query Editor, and uh, oh, I'm running on the preview of it, but uh, here we go. So we've got a, a few folders in this. We've got lots of different queries that are actually going on inside this. Um, they're all Power Query, okay? So everything uh, that we have through here has got lots of steps. Everything is there, okay? So that's the Power BI side of things. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm just gonna close this and we're gonna look at what happened in the Excel side. It said, look, we created an empty table called metrics with Power Query because it was a DAX table. There are some columns in the data model that we could not hide. I do not have an API that allows me to do this. I will be asking Microsoft about this next week, asking them, begging them to please give me that API. And there are some sorting hierarchies. That's the second thing that I'll be begging them for um, that, uh, that I could not create. So these are things that you would need to do manually, but here's all the power queries. Let's go check one out. 
There's Azure DB. We'll start there. And if you take a look at budgets, you can see all the steps are here. The end date, the start date queries, calendar, all of the steps have come over. We've brought all of the Power Queries in there. That one was just an, a later one. Let me refresh that. It's been a while since I did this. But it gives me all these things. Plus, we've also wrapped this in a, a safe output, a blank table. So what we end up with is I didn't know what data you were going to have. So I've said I know what the columns are based on Power BI. I'm going to create those with missing values. We're then going to try and go and get your data. But just in case it wasn't authenticated, we'll fall back to an empty table so that we can create all the relationships and the measures. Let's go and take a look at that. Ba -ba -ba. This is not laid out the same because that's really hard to do. But at the end of the day here, this is the data model that existed in Power BI, complete with the separated metrics table over here. And look at all those measures, they all came across as well. So I can now quickly go and say, let's go pivot from data model, there we go. Let's go to our calendar. Uh, let's use a year because month names won't sort because I haven't set up the sorting hierarchies. Let's go and put the poison sale group over here and let's go and find our metrics table. There we are. And we'll put our sales dollars on there. Uh, looks like there's a relationship needed on this one. Why is, oh, I know why the relationship need is there. Let me show you actually how I can tell. Here's another feature. This is called Pivot Sleuth. Pivot Sleuth is helping diagnose why this is a problem. And it says, metrics is disconnected table. Your measures are most likely calculated incorrectly, but they're gonna cause this particular error message to come up. What you should do is you should go and hide the unhidden column on this table. Meaning, we should go over here, right click and hide this. I wish I could do this by default, I can't. And as soon as I do that, the thing goes away and everything works fine and pivot sleuth, now it gives you a clean bill of health, okay? So if you ever have a yellow message on Power Pivot, Pivot Sleuth will help you fix it. So um, it's kind of some cool stuff there uh, along the way. So Zach, I don't know, hopefully that's that's answered some of your questions here. Um, I don't do a ton with Power BI stuff. The main sort of thrust that I'll do is I'll import a workbook back into Power Pivot. Uh, the other thing that we can do is we can connect to a Power BI desktop file. Once we connect with a Power BI desktop file, you can look at it with Query Sleuth. You can also look at it with DAX Sleuth. And some of these items here will work with the DAX Sleuth, but unfortunately we can't make any changes to the Power Queries at all. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I haven't really spent a lot of time trying to invest in the Power BI side is because the major a lot of the functionality of what happens inside Monkey Tools is really um, built around managing Power Queries. And in Power BI, we can't modify them. It won't let us which is really, really frustrating, so. Um, yeah, so for API connection, mostly it's because some of the orgs don't give access to where the PBIX files are located. Uh, rather, they want people to review reports on the web through the Power BI service. Uh, I totally get that. Um, what I would say in that case, though, is that um, when you go and uh, and look, and this, this is not a feature that's specific to my tool. This is a repurposed button, okay? But if you use the from Power BI, this will allow you to go and create your analysis services pivot table against your Power BI data sets that are published. Okay, so this is going to go and grab a few of these. So um, obviously, I'm not going to show you the skill wave one here, but I can insert a, a pivot table or a regular table um, from my travel stats data set. This is a model that started in Excel, was published to Power BI, and uh, I can then go once I do all this stuff, of course, do, 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 do. Um, this will allow me to go and start building pivot tables again. So there we go. There's all the measures that we have in this. I cannot see the relationships. Here's all my, uh, all my um, dimensions that I have with this. Um, so I can start going and saying, hey, look, I want to build something by month name. Let's put our year up here and let's go and take a look at uh, the stays selected. So this will tell me how many hotel stays I have by individual periods here. Maybe I'll move year onto columns. Um, so there we go. We can actually start seeing these kind of things. So this is building pivot tables against a Power BI source, and that's built into Excel. Um, typically, if I have to build a model and I'm not getting access to the PBIX, what I've had to do in certain cases is basically build like this and then take my data and re-ingest it into Power Query in order to go and build a model. Not ideal by any stretch, but it does work, okay? So um, 
I am curious though. Like, so they give you API access to the stuff, but won't give you the uh, the PBI access. It's interesting. Um, it's very interesting. So, anyhow, um, yeah, you're you're welcome. In, indeed, uh, hopefully it's been uh, hopefully it's been helpful and uh, a little bit educational there. So, uh, so that is a couple of other features in Monkey Tools as well. So, um, so listen, guys, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this one up only because. I could talk about monkey tools for probably another two hours showing you more demos and whatnot, but I'm cognizant of the fact that, you know, people probably didn't sign up for that. Um, and, uh, and honestly, I kind of want to have dinner tonight too. So um, the, uh, let me go and just hop, hop back over here. So like I say, there are a ton of features that are in this. Uh, one of the things that I need to do is do a better job of making sure that there's video content available for this. There is a lot of information that is available um, for this at Monkey Tools. So if you are interested in picking Monkey Tools up, you can uh, you can get that at the Monkey Tools website. It is at monkeytools.ca. The front page, if you scroll down, has the ability to get the installer and the purchase options for the uh, the tool, including the free version. Um, there is a knowledge base at monkey tools slash knowledge base. And uh, you also, if you're interested um, in coming and taking a course that teaches you how to do all the stuff behind the scenes here and why this uh, you know, is, is really useful, uh, you get a, a free pro license uh, with your subscription to our self-service BI Academy. Um, is always something to, uh, to be aware of. And if you love it, and I mean, who wouldn't? Uh, we also have an affiliate program as well, just uh, just to say you can earn 20% on sales. So just fill uh, fill things out from there. So um, Sherry, um, awesome. I'm glad that you downloaded today. Can't wait to use it. That's fantastic. Uh, one thing I'm going to ask you to do though, Sherry, um, when you get into uh, when you get into Monkey Tools for the first time, if you downloaded it before about three hours ago, you might just want to go and do um, this thing right here under the Options Monkey. You might want to go and say Check for Update Now because if you're not on this most recent release uh, here, then you won't have the new um, the new modern pivot monkey. So uh, so just be aware of that. Um, outside of that, you'll get a notification. Um, whatever your configuration here, it starts by uh, 14 days by default, but you can always change that um, to it'll prompt you to let you know that there's a new version. So in a couple of weeks, if you don't download it, it will pop pop up and let you know. So. Um, Fantastic. I, I, yeah. Hey, listen, uh, monkeys have never been this cool. Indeed. I love that comment. That's fantastic. Um, the update is available. There you go. See, told you. Um, there you go, folks. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you found that it useful. Uh, I will be posting the recording of this tomorrow um, because I'm going to be at the MVP Summit. So I want to make sure that it's out nice and easy there. Uh, these are some of the different areas where you can find resources on Monkey Tools. Outside of that, thank you very much for coming. I hope, uh, I hope you've learned something interesting. It's inspired some things along the way and that you'll dive in there. And don't forget, there is a feedback form in the product. If you find any bugs or you've got any feature suggestions, by all means, use it. I love to hear from people and about the things that I can uh, do to make other people's lives easier. So thanks very much, folks. We'll see you next time.